Travis, you want to get, get started? Absolutely. So thank you. Good to see everyone. Nice to be here. Um, a quick introduction. So uh, Dr. Gleb Zapersky is an internationally renowned thought leader in future proofing. He specializes in helping forward-looking leaders secure their organization's future by forecasting and addressing threats and maximizing opportunities. He serves as the CEO of the Future Proofing Consultancy Disaster Avoidance Experts, a best-selling author of several traditionally published books. Dr. Gleb is, uh, is most well known for his 2019 bestseller, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, published by Career Press and his 2020 bestselling book, The Blind Spots Between Us, how to overcome unconscious cognitive bias and build better relationships published by uh, New Harbinger. His groundbreaking thought leadership was featured in over 550 articles and 450 interviews in prominent venues. They include USA Today, Time, Fast Company, CBS News, Fortune, Inc. Magazine, CNBC, and more. Dr. Gleb's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, and training. His clients include innovative startups, major nonprofits, and Fortune 500 companies, ranging from Aflac to Xerox. His expertise comes from his research background as a behavioral scientist with 15 years in academia, including seven as a professor at The Ohio State University, which he mentioned. In his free time, he makes sure to spend abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his own personal life turning into a disaster. Uh, and to help take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, we've asked him to speak with us on the subject of defeating unconscious bias successfully for risk management professionals. Dr. Gleb, why don't you take it away? Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Travis. Really appreciate this. And by the way, I'm developing a free course series with RIMS National right now, specifically on cognitive bias risk and how that relates to the specific insurance industry risk, the nine branded risks, and so on, that specifically targeted risk management professionals within RIMS and especially within the insurance field. So happy to answer any questions about that. I'll send you more information resources after the presentation, but just wanted to let you know that. So I'm quite plugged into RIMS, present often to RIMS chapters, did a number of RIMS national webinars, collaborate extensively with RIMS folks. All right, so without further ado, let's talk specifically about how do you defeat unconscious bias? Well, what is that? All of these sorts of things. The first part of the presentation, we'll talk about unconscious bias, what that is. It's more broadly cognitive biases. These, you probably heard these terms. Some of you are know what they are, some of you don't. We'll go in depth into them, how do I identify them. And then the second part of the presentation, we'll talk about how specifically to address them. How do you defeat them? The first part is knowledge, right? In order to understand what you're addressing, you need to know it. And then the second part will be actually addressing it, fighting these unconscious biases and addressing the risks that are associated with these unconscious biases. Now, probably there's something that you started thinking and when you first heard me speak, not when you saw me, but when you heard me speak, because obviously I have an accent. So where are you from? That's a question I get asked pretty often. Where are you from? And I'll be happy to answer that. I'm a, from a country called Moldova, this really small country that you see over there. And you have to actually have an arrow to point out where it is that it's that small. It's a small country in Eastern Europe that was dominated by Russia and was liberated in 1991 from Russian Soviet domination. And my parents came here to New York City, actually. And that's where I grew up. So New York City is really home for me. And right now I live in Columbus, Ohio. I actually prefer Columbus, Ohio. It's much more livable, much less bustle and hustle. But New York City is where, home. And I was especially glad that they left Moldova when I saw in 1996 a world value survey that found that Moldova was one of the, was among all the countries surveyed, the least happy country in the world. Can you imagine that? The least happy country in the world. I'm glad that they left. And like I said, settled in New York City, it's a cultural metropolis, melting cub and so on. 
And I heard all of these diverse accents around me in school, in the neighborhood. So I felt very comfortable with my accent. And I know a number of immigrants who came to the United States, especially not to New York City, but to places like Utah, to places like Columbus, Ohio, where there are less frequently here other accents, especially accents that are in Hispanic, you, those folks tend to try to drop their accents. And when you come as a young person, like I did as a kid, it's not that hard. But my parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage and in New York City, I just didn't feel it's a big deal. So I didn't try to drop my accent. I kept my accent. And I found out later as I was going into my graduate program and studying unconscious bias and risk management and decision-making, and the cognitive biases, the dangerous judgment errors caused by our brain's wiring that bring this all about, that that was actually a dumb idea. It was a bad, bad decision on my part because of something called accent discrimination. Accent discrimination is a real thing. If you look at the research on accents, and there's been extensive studies done on this, Americans by and large, the average American discriminates toward those with accents that are not mainstream American. So there's discrimination toward people with foreign accents, toward people with regional accents, unless you're from the same region. So somebody from the South will get discriminated against in New York City. Someone with a New York accent will get discriminated against in the South. So anything except a mainstream American accent will be discriminated against. That person will be seen as less trustworthy, less credible, foreign accents especially. So this is this false perception of being less trustworthy. There is only one foreign accent to which this doesn't apply, and that's the British accent. They still have that cultural imperialism going for them. Now, this accent discrimination, I'm drawing attention to it, is part of a broader trend. And that is called the halo effect and the horns effect. The halo effect and the horns effect. Now we're getting more to the fundamental core of unconscious bias. What is this unconscious bias? So the halo effect and the horns effect are what we talk about when we talk about unconscious bias. It's a part of what we talk about when we use that sort of terminology, unconscious bias, discrimination against others. The horns effect refers to when you dislike one characteristic of someone, like their accent, like their appearance, like their value set, like their religion, anything like that, like their gender, sexuality, ability, disability, if you dislike that one characteristic, then you'll have two negative view of their other characteristics. You will distrust them, you'll dislike them because they're not like you. They're not part of your tribe. That's what it feels like. I'm not just saying you in particular, the individual who's listening to me, I'm saying humanity. This is what the human condition is like. We tend to dislike and distrust those people who are different than us. That's the horns effect. And if it's something that's salient, significant to us, an accent is pretty significant to most folks. The halo effect. The halo effect is kind of the opposite. So the horns effect, like somebody has little horns. And the halo effect is like somebody has a little halo. <laughs> if you like one characteristic of someone, like their accent. So somebody from the South with a Southern accent will tend to like other folks with a Southern accent. A New Yorker who's not in New York City will tend, and if they have a New York accent, I don't really have a New York accent, but a New Yorker who lived, grew up there, and they acquired that New York accent like Dr. Anthony Fauci. So here's a New York accent. I bet he unknowingly has a predisposition toward other people from New York City because of that same New York accent. And that applies to all sorts of regional accents and all sorts of foreign accents. So if you like one characteristic of someone, you'll tend to have two positive view of, of all of their other characteristics. And this applies not, of course, only to accent, it applies to all of these sorts of things, religion, values, appearance of all sorts, your regional geography, which college you went to, all of these sorts of things. It's especially dangerous for business relationships. I'll give you an interesting example. I was giving a presentation here in Columbus, Ohio. And as some folks know, and I said, <laughs> at the, I was contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes when I was a professor at Ohio State. The big, big, big football here team here is Ohio State. That's the big sports team. And so many fans here, it's very popular. Our big rivals are the University of Michigan Wolverines. And unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to wipe the floor with them this year because they, you know, COVID, they got supposedly got sick with COVID. I'm just kidding, of course. <laughs> but they, they did get sick with COVID. And so they weren't able to face us this year, almost caused us to not go into the playoffs. But the thing with this rivalry is it's pretty passionate. It's very powerful. So I was giving a presentation in 2018 to 
a group of HR professionals at the Diversity Inclusion Conference, Regional Diversity Inclusion Conference, over 100 people in the room, senior DEI professionals, HR DEI professionals. And I asked them, how many of you, this was a closing keynote, how many of you would hire a Michigan fan? How many of you here in Central Ohio would hire a University of Michigan fan? And you know what? Only three people raised their hand. Three people would hire a University of Michigan fan. And I gave them a chance to change their mind, but they didn't. It's, I'm glad, especially of this, because I have it on video in the case, you know, and I have all of the responses on video, just happened to be videotaping that. So it's an indication of our predisposition to orient toward this horns effect, not liking these people. And of course, they're much more likely to hire Buckeyes fans. And it seemed, of course, irrational because what does going to a certain college, you know, rooting for a certain team, you know, you might be a Michigan fan without going to Michigan. What does rooting for a certain team mean for your performance in the workplace? Pretty much nothing. <laughs> but this creates a certain sense of tribe. Which tribe are you from? Which tribe are you not from? And that creates a distance and a barrier and harms business relationships. Now, we'll be using polling throughout this presentation. So I want you to take a look at the poll option right now. For those of you who've used Zoom before, a Zoom polling, you'll know what it's like. For those who didn't, you'll immediately see a poll option popping up in front of you. So please use that poll option to choose whether you've ever observed the negative impact of the halo effect or the horns effect on yourself or your peers. So please go ahead, vote. Okay, I see that about 70% of the people voted. Great, let's get that a little bit more. Okay, I'll give you five more seconds to make your voice heard. I have 80% of people voting right now. All right, so we overwhelmingly see that this is definitely impactful. You've seen either the halo effect or the horns effect or both negatively impact yourself or your peers. So that's something that you need to realize and think about as you're going through your workday, as you're thinking about your company, your team, what's going on there is the halo effect or the horns effect negatively impacting the situation. And you need to educate them about this as well. Keep this in mind yourself and educate others. All right. Let's talk a little bit about more of the broader framework of what is going on here and how do we need to address it. So the broader framework I want to share with you is emotional intelligence and social intelligence. Emotional intelligence are the skills necessary to understand what's going on within ourselves. These halo effects and horns effects and other cognitive biases understanding them within ourselves takes emotional intelligence, which refers to being able to sense our own emotions and being able to influence our emotions. The halo effect and the horns effect, they're not rational thoughts. You know, if these eight DEI HR leaders, they weren't rationally thinking that Michigan fans make bad members of the, in the workplace, bad team members, and therefore I won't hire them. They just had a yuck feeling toward Michigan fans. And that feeling, that emotion, caused them to be everything else being equal, not hire a Michigan fan, everything else being equal, and perhaps not even everything else, hire a Buckeye fan. That's how our minds work, these feelings, these intuitions. So you need to be aware of where they're leading you and then be able to influence yourself, to steer yourself in the right direction. So that's one, that's about you. The other, so that's about your emotions. The other aspect here is social intelligence. So social intelligence is about other people, being aware and being able to manage their emotions and their relationships with each other. So you want to be able to notice what's going on in terms of cognitive biases of all sorts, including halo effect, horns effect, and other forms of unconscious bias. And the conscious bias refers to various forms of discrimination. There are other cognitive biases that we'll get to just so you understand the broader context here. So the halo effect and the horns effect are only two out of a number of forms of discrimination with an unconscious bias. And again, there are a number of cognitive biases. You want to be aware of what's going on with other people when they're having the halo effect or the horns effect is going on. 
and being able to influence them to steer them away from the halo effect or the horns effect and other problems. And both in your immediate interactions with them and in how they interact with other people. And that's what social intelligence is about. So emotional intelligence about you, your emotions, your self-awareness and self-management, social intelligence about other people, being aware of them and being able to influence them. Now, what is this, what I'm talking about, these emotions, these intuitions? Why is that important? Aren't we taught that our gut reactions, our intuitions are the right thing? Aren't gurus who tell us all the time to go with your gut, trust your intuition, follow your heart? They do. That's the message sent by people like Malcolm Gladwell, who tells you to blink, or Tony Robbins, who tells you to be primal, be savage, and just going with your gut. It's such a typical trope. Unfortunately, the recent research in behavioral economics, cognitive neuroscience, psychology tells us that that's a very bad idea in professional business environments where you don't want to discriminate against others and you don't want to make bad decisions uh, based on how you feel. And when we go with what we feel, we will not hire people who are on opposing sports teams or who went to different areas or who have accents that differ from us, from ours, or who have an appearance that differs from ours. That is the tendency, the human tendencies. That's what the research shows. You know, There's research showing that people who are taller tend to be hired and given better positions and better salary. Now, is that fair? Is that logical? Is that re rational, reasonable? No, of course not. I mean, what are they better at, you know, reaching the highest shelf? <laughs> that is not great. But there's a reason that about 90, the latest figures I saw were that over 95% of CEOs in top to in the Fortune 500 companies are over six feet tall, whereas the average male is 5'8". So <laughs> that's an example of where height makes a big difference. Pardon the pun. So this is something that very much is you need to be aware of. Trusting your gut feels very comfortable, but it can lead to disastrous decisions because our gut is actually not evolved for the modern world. It's evolved for the ancient savanna. And in that sense, in that area, it made a ton of sense to pick the tallest males, the most healthy and powerful looking ones as our leaders, chiefs promote them and so on. In that environment where we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people were hunters, foragers, and gatherers, it made a lot of sense to be very tribal because if we weren't sufficiently tribal, we'd be kicked out of our tribe and we'd die or our tribes would fall apart and then we'd die as well. And you notice we're the descendants of those who didn't die. That's how Darwinism and evolution works that survive the survival of the fittest. We are the remnants of the fittest. And so we didn't die. Naturally, we also have to be hostile to those in that environment who are not part of our tribe, because if we, had, if we weren't sufficiently hostile, they'd take us over, take our lands and you know, kill us and so on, and then we die. And again, you notice we're the one descendants of those who didn't die. So that tribalism is another fundamental aspect of what's going on that causes us to have these forms of unconscious bias within us that causes us to discriminate against other people in irrational, harmful, damaging ways where our gut intuitions tell us one thing, but the reality is totally different. And here, this is part of a broader pattern of dangerous judgment errors, unconscious bias, other discriminatory impulses. There are a number of dangerous judgment errors that are a part of a broader tendency. That's the course that I'm working on with RIMS are cover all sorts of cognitive biases. These dangerous judgment errors that come from our evolutionary background. What I just talked about, tribalism and so on, these tribal competitions for reproduction within the tribe, you know, the tallest males and so on reproduce outside of the tribe, you know, who, which tribes have the most loyal tribal members and which ones don't, that really makes a difference. So our evolutionary background and just the structure of our brain, just the way that our brain happens to be wired. So those are the things that really make a difference to these cognitive biases. And these are the dangerous judgment errors that come from, the, from our evolutionary background that cause us to make pretty irrational decisions. Now, you'll see another poll popping up right now. And I want to ask you, have you ever felt that you're confident about something? 
in the substantial something that was substantive, but then you turned out to be wrong. So you felt confident, comfortable that something was right, something substantial, but then you turned out to be wrong about that thing. Please go ahead and vote. Great, I see 86% of the people voted. I'll give folks three more seconds to vote to make your votes hard. All right, so we see that again, overwhelmingly, that's an experience that's shared by the vast majority of you, 95% of you that have that confidence and about something substantial, but you turned out to be wrong. And that's the feeling, That's you want to be aware of that. And hey, how did you feel after that? that, that probably felt pretty bad. That is the kind of feeling that comes from dangerous judgment errors, this overconfidence into something and then us being wrong. And we need to learn that that's a feeling that we experience, unfortunately, too often, and we don't realize it. So sometimes we realize it and sometimes we don't realize it, like when we don't hire the right person or when a business relationship that should have worked out doesn't didn't work out, when we don't make a successful sale to a client. You know, lots of various other things. When, when you're doing, let's say, an audit and you trust someone a little too much, and then they keep bad processes on the books that eventually end up being putting the company in a bad situation, that happens. I've seen that happen way too often when I work with risk assessment professionals and look at their auditing process where they don't want to push too much in a certain situation because they like someone, they have that halo effect and that causes them to run into problems. So you have the opposite as well, where you actually do make a bad decision, but you don't know that it happens. All right, let's talk a little bit about how do you identify these dangerous judgment errors and what I'll give you as a resource after the presentation is an assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. I'll email it to you, so don't need to take notes on it. I'll show it to you right now using screen sharing. But it basically focuses on the 30 most dangerous errors in professional setting, 30 most dangerous cognitive biases. It evaluates their extent and their impact in your workplace, your specific workplace, and provides you with the next steps for addressing them. So that's what it's about. All right, at this stage, I'll want you to use the chat function. So please make sure to turn on your chat function. Oh, I see somebody had uh, asked a question about the phone number. So I think I mentioned to the organizers that we don't have a phone number. Otherwise, we of course wouldn't be able to use the chat function and the polling feature. So it's meant to for everyone to be able to engage. Great, so this will be for Question one. All right, so you see the assessment and next steps and dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. And that's what it's about. So I'll go through it. There's just a little bit of content about, now here are the directions. It's the first important part. This, you don't need to say, is this the halo effect or the horns effect, you know, or all of these, whatever tribalism, other biases. That'll get to in the later section of the assessment. The assessment itself and why it's so helpful for anyone to take in your team, you can take it without knowing anything about cognitive biases because it's about behaviors. It's about problematic behaviors that might occur in professional situations. And your goal as you take the assessment and anyone who takes the assessment as your team, I encourage you to have your team take the assessment. You want to indicate how often this problem occurred in the past year. And again, this will be in percentage terms out of all the possible times that the problem might have occurred. So you can do this for a specific organization, department, team, whatever, or, or for yourself. You don't overthink it. Each question should take 10, 15, 20 seconds. So it doesn't have to be precise. Go with your first impression on this. It'll most likely be accurate. So let's take a look. I'll want to start with... Uh, Number six. So let's see. So I'll actually go with number six first. Now, when a potential or current employee was evaluated, what percentage of the situations 
was the evaluation too positive to, due to factors not relevant to their job competency or organizational fit? So potential or current employee. So that it relates to when you're hiring someone or promoting them or annual evaluation, what percentage of the situations was the person evaluated too nicely due to factors not relevant to their job competency or organizational fit? Please chat your answers into the chat box right now. In was relevant to your workplace. Go ahead. 66%, 5 5%, 25%, another 5%, 75%, 10%, 50%, 20%. Let's get a couple more, 25%, 50%. So we see that there is a range of answers. When you are the five to 10% range, it's not a big deal. That's that's not a problem. That's not a problem. Uh, Axel Soder, you messaged me directly, so you want to make sure to mark it, sending it to everyone. So, you want to uh, realize it's not a big problem, five to ten percent, unless it happens super consistently with the same person with the same evaluator. But generally, it's not a problem if it just if it's varied across the organization. If you're getting into the 10 to 20%, it's a little bit more of a problem that you wanna take a look at it, see if there's something going on there and try to fix it. But if it's getting into the 20 and above range, then it's more of a serious problem because your organization is clearly suffering from the halo effect. So this is about the halo effect. This question, when you'll get to the end, go to the end where the set, where the, where the next steps part is, talks about the question, the cognitive bias behind it, and what you do as the next step. So this is about the halo effect. That means, you know, if you're one of the people who's 75, 45, 50%, 50%, 75, 66%, that will be, the, that will, your organization has some folks, at least some folks who are suffering from the halo effect. And that's of course creates a lot of problems when people are evaluated too positively due to where they should be because of factors not related to organizational fit. Now, cognitive bias is that's an example of something directly related to unconscious bias. So this discriminatory impulse. And I want to make sure that we talk about other cognitive biases, not simply, un, not simply this halo effect. So we see how it impacts how unconscious bias ties to other irrational decisions that we tend to make. Let's talk about number one. What percentage of projects missed a deadline or went over budget in your organization in the last year, in your workplace in the last year? So your, your percentage, chat please into the box the same way. So 70 70%, 50%, 60%, 90%, 60%, 40%, 40%. Let's get a couple more folks. And in 40%, 5%, oh, nice job, Brendan. So again, this is the same principle, five to 10%, not that big a deal, you know, getting into 15 to 20% of a little bit more of a deal, you might wanna take a look if it's getting over 20 and above, that becomes more of a serious issue because you're essentially misallocating resources. There are some projects that are getting too many things. Yeah, so John says 90% construction projects and that's, a pretty typical for, for construction projects. When you, there was a study that came out uh, in 2002 that showed that construction projects, 86% of all major construction projects run over time and budget. So 86% of them. And that's not a good thing. <laughs> that's called the planning fallacy. So the planning fallacy is where we make a plan and we feel that things will go according to plan. That's intuitive. That's how it feels because you know, you've know you probably heard the phrase, failing to plan is planning to fail and the, indicating that we should make a plan and then we will succeed based on the plan. That's a really bad phrase. The much more accurate phrase what I teach my clients to use and everyone who I train like you is failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. Failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. Not putting in enough resources, not putting in enough time, not putting enough various contingencies into place is a big, big problem for risk managers, risk management professionals, where this is a battle that is important for you to fight. And where if you don't make a good enough plan, 
where you're getting over 20% falling into the planning fallacy, then you are not allocating resources in the right way. The company is suffering. You're not getting the, you're not doing the right projects in the right manner. And it's especially problematic when you don't pivot in nearly quickly enough manner to address problems in the plan that they come up. For example, with COVID-19, so many companies failed to pivot in a nearly quickly enough manner to address this problem when it was coming up. They were blindsided. And I'm not sure if your company was or if it wasn't, but when I, I do presentations on COVID, when I do presentations, the large majority of people tell me that their company underreacted to COVID and not in a timely enough manner and not in an extensive enough manner for the reality of the threat. Now, let's talk a little bit about another form of social interaction. What percent of team conflicts occurred because someone overestimated the effectiveness of their communication skills and their persuasiveness? Please go ahead. What percentage of team conflicts occurred for that reason? Number two. So for all team conflicts that occurred, what percentage occurred because folks are overestimated how effective they are in communicating and persuading others? 33%, 40%, 50%, 50%, 30%, 40%, 15%, 40%, 15%, 50%. 50%. Mm -hmm. So this relates to a cognitive bias called the illusion of transparency. When we communicate, it feels like we are very effective communicators. It's intuitive to us that we're effective communicators. It feels, our gut intuition, is that the message that we're sending across is 100% received by the listener and 100% internalized. That is how it feels. That is, of course, not the case. First of all, our message may not be 100% received. You know, we might be having technical glitches in our virtual world because that's the way that we mostly meet these days. Plenty of technical glitches. You know, how many meetings start with, you know, Mike, your the your mic isn't on. You know, you're you're on mute. Something like that. That's the phrase that people hear so often at the beginning of the meeting, and I see a number of people grinning because they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And so you miss things and you don't hear things. And there are lots of other glitches. That's one issue. But of course, even in person that can happen, they, person, there can be a loud noise that distracts someone or their mind might be wandering. They might be thinking about what they're gonna have for lunch or a big meeting with their boss. Or you know, they might be feeling the buzz of their phone that they're getting a notification of about something that they might miss you know, two, the next two sentences that you're saying because they might be thinking who is you know, buzzing me right now. <laughs> so that's something that might be distracting them that they might not receive your message. And then they might not internalize it because of course they're interpreting your message through their filters. They're looking for what they want to hear and not what necessarily what you're telling them, which is so often why miscommunication occurs in companies. And that's a big, big risk factor, of course, for you as risk management professionals, really thinking about miscommunication, misunderstanding as a major risk factor that very often happens. All right, so I'll stop sharing the screen, getting out of chat, getting back into polling. So next poll, assessment. Do you think it would be valuable for you and your team to take the assessment and address the mental blind spots it uncovers? Please go ahead and vote. Would it be valuable for you and your team? We have about 70% of the people voting. Let's get a few more. I'll give you five more seconds to make your voice heard. Great, so I see that for the vast majority of you, it would be valuable, that's excellent. So the first step, I'll, like I said, I'll send it to you afterward. And then the first step after that would be for you to take it yourself, go through it, familiarize yourself with it. There'll be a section where you can evaluate the impact, give your overall workplace a score, and then see what the next steps are, and then bring it to your team. So to see it as valuable, you would wanna bring it to your team, share it with them, encourage folks to take it and have a discussion about it and take the next steps. Excellent. Great. So 
let's talk a little bit about how to address these problems. We talked about the first part, which is knowledge, understanding, and awareness, then addressing these. There are two techniques that I want to talk about for making good decisions that address unconscious bias and other cognitive biases. So addressing them in order to ensure that you make the best decision. The first is to is a quick technique. You can use it, you should use it daily, you know, five to 10 times a day on decisions that you don't want to screw up. Whenever you're writing an important email, whenever you're preparing for a meeting, whenever any sort of human interaction that you want to make sure to do well and you want to prepare for it, or any decision where it's not a huge decision, but let's say you're thinking about deciding between some suppliers of something that's not crucial, but you don't want to screw up and make a bad decision any sort of decision that you're making in the workplace. What kind of a business relationship? Do you even want to go to a certain meeting or not if it will take a lot of your time? And is it necessary, is it worthwhile to explore something? There are five questions that you want to ask to avoid decision disasters. They're not meant to get you the perfect answer. They're meant to be good enough. So this is a good enough technique. So this is meant to give you a good enough answer that will address a large number of the biases of the risks of the problems it won't optimize things it won't seize all the opportunities but it'll get you a good enough answer what important information didn't i yet fully consider there are two parts to that important information you don't want to get stuck in analysis paralysis and that's why you're going to look and think about what information is important in this decision you don't want to look at everything so what's important and what's not look for the important information and then what didn't I yet fully consider? We tend to not consider information that goes against our intuition, that goes against our beliefs, that goes against what we're comfortable. So you want to make sure to look at that information, what goes against what you're comfortable twice as hard and weigh twice as much because our intuition would prevent us from making a good decision otherwise. Next. What dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? And you, after you take, go for the assessment a couple of times, you'll have a pretty good sense of the kind of dangerous judgment errors there are and how you can address them. So that is going to be really good for you. So if you, if you are relating to people, the halo effect and the horns effect might be going on and so on. Next. What would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So think about perhaps your RIMS uh, Utah group peers or somebody else who you trust who is a wise advisor, maybe someone in your workplace, maybe a mentor, someone if you have a coach or someone like that. What would they tell you, that kind of little angel on your shoulder? What would they say in this situation? You get about 50% of the benefit of this question just by asking it. And you get the other 50% of the benefit, of course, by calling this person. So, or if you're a millennial, texting this person. Next, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So think about the decision, imagine it completely failed and think about why are the reasons why it failed. Don't, don't start by thinking about the reasons. You wanna first give yourself permission to say it completely failed and then think about the reasons. That really opens you up to brainstorming much more effectively according to the research on how this sort of question should be asked. And finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? What would cause you to change your mind about this decision? When we make a decision, we tend to be pretty committed to it. It's hard to free ourselves of it, but it's much easier if we decide in advance that certain new information would cause you to reevaluate your decision. I'll give an example of how to apply this. So I mentioned email. Let's say you're writing an important email to a client trying to persuade them to do something that's hard, not pleasant, but they, you know they should do it and they know they should do it. Or perhaps a colleague in your workplace, a, a peer who is at the same level as you, as you, you, you don't have direct authority over them and you're collaborating with them and both of you know that they should do something, but it's a hassle, it's annoying and they're foot dragging. So you want to write an email to persuade this person to do this. This is a perfect technique to use, after, to use as you go through the email, as you're writing up the email. You wanna first use these questions and then use them, them to inform that email. So what important information didn't I yet fully consider as you're starting to write the email, kind of getting your initial thoughts on paper, not on paper, or on, on screen, the kind of things you might not consider are the reasons why your client or your peer in the company would find it a hassle, annoying, why they would rather not do it. Now, 
if you don't include the information, it, it's intuitive to not include that information. You don't want to draw their attention to all the you know, that unpleasant things about it. But if you can actually include that information and say, here's why you should do it anyway, you address their objections in advance and you have a much more powerful email. What dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? You know, maybe you are from risk management and they're from sales. And there's inherent cogn there's inherent horns effect I've seen often in insurance companies and other companies that hire RIMS professionals between the risk management professionals and sales folks, because they're kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum. So you need to be aware that there's going to be horns effects going on and you need to address them in the process. What would a trust and objective advisor suggest I do? So think about somebody else, an external person. What would they suggest you do? If it's an important enough email, let them take a look at the draft. How have you addressed all the ways this could fail? Now imagine, let's say this person is in a bad mood because there's been a, you know, one of these new strains right, that are spreading around the country. Columbus, Ohio, just there was a recent study by the Ohio State University showing that a strain very much like the UK one became dominant in Columbus over three short weeks from late December to early January. So there's an outbreak going on here right now where I am. So I'm definitely more strict lockdown than I would be otherwise. So maybe there um, there's an outbreak and they're closed schools and their kids are home. They can't go out anywhere. They're pissed and their kids are all over them and they're annoyed. Read this email as to somebody who's pissed and annoyed and decide what steps you would take to address the situation by redrafting the email to make sure that they are not going to be as pissed and annoyed and upset as they would be uh, as they would be if they received the email that you originally drafted. And finally, what new information would cause you to would cause you to change your mind, would cause you to revisit this decision? An easy one here is timing. So let's say if they don't respond, if they don't respond within the next you know, five days, you decide that you'll give them a call. So again, that's a timing. If you don't, they don't respond within five days, you'll give them a call. That's a clear timeline, clear revision and that will give you a very clear step forward. All right, so same way that we did before. We'll have a poll on the five questions. Do you think it would be valuable for you and your team to use the five questions to avoid decision disasters to make good enough decisions? Great, I see 70% of the people voted, five more seconds. Thank you, Logan, I'm, I'm glad you appreciate it. All right, great, so this is perfect. Uh, everyone thinks that it would be great if you and your team use the questions, definitely send an email with that. All right, let's talk about a bigger technique. So one that you want to use when you want to make the best decision. So this is a longer technique. The previous one just don't, takes a couple of minutes to go through once you have it in your mind. It's very quick, very easy. This one takes at least an hour if you are doing a moderately important decision for a longer one, especially if you're doing it. By the way, the previous one, the five questions, you can do it as part of a team decision-making process. Just structure the agenda of the meeting around the five questions and it makes the whole meeting run much smoother, easier. You get everyone on the same page and you just hammer through the questions. It takes a lot less time. This is a much more thorough process. You, when you want to make the best decision possible, really major decision. The first, so there are eight steps here. First, you want to identify the need for decision-making process. And you know, lots of folks don't think about this as something that's important, but it's very often not noticed when there's no explicit problem, but you really need to address the decision. So for example, let's you know, talk about uh, in insurance, right? How many companies got uh, insurance with uh, when they got business continuity insurance and thought that it was going to protect them against COVID. And of course, 
it doesn't protect you against COVID because it's essentially property casualty insurance if you read your contract carefully enough. But most business owners didn't. And right now there's a lot of legal wrangling about this question. Most of them I don't think will win, but you know, who knows? So this is an example where you really should have taken the time to be more thorough, know about what kind of insurance you're getting. Our gut instinct might make it get uncomfortable for us to accept the need for a tough decision. So let's say if you are a Buckeye, you know, fellow Buckeye, it might be a little bit tougher for me to make an uncomfortable decision about whether we should still keep working together if you screw up too often. And I know that, and therefore I will judge other Buckeyes as a little bit less trustworthy than I intuitively feel. So this is usually about people. You want to recognize the need before it becomes an emergency. Then you want to gather information from diverse perspectives, especially for people with whom you disagree. So especially from people with whom different appearance, different tribes, you want to weigh that information more heavily because it helps you recognize your potential bias blind spots. So recognize that, weigh that information more heavily. They, they're not necessarily right, but you need to weigh that information more heavily to against, go against your biases. Then set specific and clear goals. You want a clear vision of the desired outcome. What's your future vision? Paint a clear vision of that and work backward from there. Particularly when you're trying to solve a problem, you think it's a one-time decision, but there's a root cause. So you wanna look at underlying processes and issues. Then develop clear decision-making criteria. What criteria will you use to make your decision? And you want to use them to weigh your options. Don't look at the options first, use the criteria. So let's say you're trying to hire someone and that's a very important question to address unconscious bias in it. You want to develop criteria like salary, fit, diversity, experience in the field, their network, and then weigh each of these. So their salary demands, you know, if you're, very, doing very well and flush with cash, their salary demands might be less important. So you're going to put that on a four. If you if you really are, have a strong fit focus on diversity, you might put that on a nine or a ten. If you if you're really valuing their network and that's really why you want to bring them into the position, then you want to put something like a nine or a ten on that. So if for each of the criteria, make sure that you value them appropriately. And then you want to generate viable options, at least five viable options. It's very tempting to go for the first one or two options, but if you want to make the best decision, you really want to generate sufficient viable options. Then you want to evaluate the options. And here is where you weigh them on each of the criteria, each of, you know, Mary, Bobby, James, of, you know, Dallas, Dallas and whatever, weigh them on salary, salary and diversity, all of these other criteria and multiply the ranks by the weightings. And then you want to be aware of going with your initial preference. It's very tempting to do so when you want to look at them in a harsh light. Finally, we're going to the implementation, the last two phases. Imagine the decision completely failed and that it absolutely succeeded. This is kind of like the question number four previously. Brainstorm what problems might have led to this failure. Imagine it completely failed. Then consider how you might solve these problems and integrate the solutions into the plan for your implementation. Next, imagine the decision absolutely succeeded. It's wonderful, it completely succeeded. What are all the reasons for success and how can you bring them about? Integrate these into your implementation plan as well. The next step is making sure that your implementation goes well. You want to create clear metrics for what it means to succeed, to achieve that vision that you painted in step three. So successful metrics, evaluate them, checking in regularly to make sure that you're meeting or exceeding them and revise the implementation as needed. You might go back to some of the previous steps to revise things. All right. Let's go on to the poll on best decisions. Do you think it will be valuable for you and your team to use the best decisions method to make major decisions? Please go ahead and vote. See, we have 60% of the people who voted. Let's give folks five more seconds. All right. So we see for the vast majority of you, it would be valuable and helpful. Great, so 
share it with your team, start using it yourself and share it with your team. Make sure to use it to inform your efforts and your activities for major decisions and integrate at least some of these techniques as you go forward. All right then. And now we'll talk about the free resources and then we'll have questions and answers. So additional resources, these are free additional resources that I promised. Um, ignore the tiny URL, I'll just send them to you. We'll do the same polling. So a free coaching session with me, happy to do that on integrating the information into your organization, your needs. Then the decision aid and the five key questions to avoid decision disasters. The manual on the technique for making the best decisions. And I will also send you the assessment. So the assessment as a resource. So that will be part of everything that you'll get. And we'll do the same thing, polling. Would you like the free post webinar resources? So please go ahead, vote. And as you vote, welcome to ask me any questions about the presentation, happy to share. You can use the chat feature if that's what you prefer, or we're not a large group, so you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question verbally. Five more seconds, folks. So for those who are thinking, you can indicate your thinking, uh, just unmute yourself and say you want to ask a question or type something in the chat saying that you're you know, still typing the full question and you'll ask that. But five more seconds to see if there are any questions. And of course, I'll send you the email and you can ask me questions later. All right, look, did somebody unmute themselves? Any question? Yeah. So ahead, question, do you see the challenges in, is it kind of universal between large and small organizations? Yes, absolutely. It is universal between large and small organizations. So I see large organizations already sometimes implementing some aspects of, of course, risk management. So things like SWOT analysis and other techniques they generally don't integrate the cognitive biases. What I'm talking about here is on the cutting edge of the research, which is why RIMS invited me to develop, RIMS National invited me to develop cognitive bias risk as in something that integrates with the nine existing branded categories of insurance risk and other sorts of the RIMS portfolio. So this sort of stuff is not really being taught. The, these questions that address the cognitive bias risk but the, I see the same risks within large organizations and within small organizations. The main sort of differences I see within small organizations is they tend to have more optimism. So they tend to be more optimistic, more risk-taking, and of course, more failure <laughs> because they tend to take more risks. So I see that as being the main distinction. And there's more, how do I say this? Mm. Within small organizations, because there's usually a founder or two who are running them, they tend to, there tends to be more of a culture that's centered around, I would, not in a negative way, but you know, the cult of leadership, sort of speak, where the founder gets to determine what goes on in a very powerful way, whereas in a large organization that is much more of a formal bureaucratic process. And that formal bureaucratic process can in some ways address a lot of cognitive biases in well some of the cognitive biases but in some ways it, it internalizes a lot of cognitive it institutionalizes a lot of cognitive biases so that's another difference that i see between large and small organizations let's see somebody chatted something Oh gosh, so um, Mikhail asks, what experience, what experiences do you have with the results using your method? The um, manual I'll send you talks through a case study 
but all of my work talks about it. So I have a great deal. I mean, I've spent over 20 years using these methods and teaching folks. So if you go to my website, disasteravoidanceexperts.com, look at the consulting section, you'll have a bunch of case studies of organizations using these methods and helping themselves out. Oh, for example, I have recently worked with a, we're talking, this is a medium stage company. It's a late stage, so just very short time ago, helped the late stage startup do a COVID pivot. So shifting their strategy around COVID, their sales engagement software, their one valuation was over 1 billion, something like 1.34 billion, 500 people in the company. And they were looking at how do they shift their strategy in the context of COVID. And what they were previously going for was optimizing the technology for excellent user experience. Well, unfortunately, that's no really longer the case where that much more of the decision-making was handed over to the finance department from the sales staff. And this is a sales engagement software. And so there's much more financial pressure and their software was not really great at showing, it, it was great at technical wizardry. It wasn't really great at showing ROI, which is what the CFOs were concerned about. And so that was a major issue. There was a major blind spot where their culture was institutionalized in such a way as to favor technological wizardry. They were integrating AI and so on, but that was, really wasn't what the new market was demanding. And so they weren't realizing that. And at that pivot, we talked that through, we addressed the, those sorts of blind spots. That was a major, major planning fallacy blind spot where they made a plan, they were going through with it. They weren't realizing that what they needed to do was a serious pivot. And they did make a serious pivot away from that and a number of other issues which they made sure to take care of. So that's an experience that I had using the, the that we went through using the making the best decisions technique. And that's something that was realized as a result of making the best decisions technique. Other folks. If there are any other questions, uh, please ask them. Um, otherwise, I just want to say this has been enlightening. And I, I think it's, um, if you took a survey of those who are listening, uh, they would agree that it's a, a very practical approach to uh, decision making. So thank you. You're very welcome. Excellent. All right, everyone. Yeah. Well, great. I hope you've benefited from this and I will send you all who want the resources. I'll send it to you after the fact. All right, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank Goodbye. You, You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Travis, thank you for sponsoring. Thank you. Good to see thank you. Thank you, Travis. Appreciate thank it. You. Have a good day today. Take care. Bye-bye.